Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. There's a little bit of echo there. I think it's gone. Hi, Min. So tonight I have, my name is Corey. I'm from books, uh, from Roman's bookstore. And I have the pleasure of hosting Joshua Larry um, discussing his book, History is Delicious. Um, we'll be talking with Min Fan. Um, before I introduce the guests, I would like to let everybody know to purchase their book by using this little green button down here that says purchase the book, if you have yet to do that. Also, if you have questions, there's another tab at the bottom of your screen. It says ask a question. Please put your questions there so we can get to all of them. Okay, so Min Fan is a renowned chef and owner of Porridge and Puffs in the historic Filipino town. In the bedrock of the LA food industry, and when she is not at her restaurant, she's out there getting food for underserved communities. Joshua Lurie is an accomplished food journalist living in Los Angeles with his lovely family. He founded FoodGPS.com in 2005 and continues to showcase the best food and drink while sharing stories of people behind the flavor. Unity, that's awesome. Okay, I'm going to hand it off to you two. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Corey. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Josh. Such an honor to do this with you. And um, thank you, Romans, for this honor as well. So first and foremost, um, if you haven't seen the book, everyone, I think it should be an everyone's holiday gift list, not only for kids, but for adults, because it's such an, an awesome book. Um, as an adult, I absolutely adore it. I just think it's such a, it's, it dives deeper than you think it would. And um, and there's just tiny little gems in there that I really love. So before we get into the book, hi, Josh. Hi, great to see you. Good to see you. Um, kind of want to talk about Josh a little bit. So if you guys don't know who he is, um, I want to do a little reintro because I don't <laughs> think I've heard these answers straight from you. Um, when did you get into food writing? Food writing? Well, we could go back to college. I was the restaurant reviewer for the Vanderbilt Hustler, which was the Vanderbilt University school newspaper. So all four years I wrote about restaurants for people to experience outside the Vander bubble, which was the beyond the campus walls and inspire people to go <laughs> more local and more interesting than what they'd find with the rest chain restaurants right around campus. And then I worked in the entertainment industry for seven years once I got to LA and for JAG and NCIS, and I did a bit of TV and movie writing. And then I just applied the research and writing skills that I developed even further to something I really cared about, which was food versus TV, which I enjoy, but not as much as food. That's so cool. <laughs> I didn't know that you had um, a, a, a background in entertainment writing. Oh, so cool. Um, where does the name, uh, How did was Food GPS something that you've had since um, your college days or after that? That started at the end of 2004. My um, my dad and stepmom were traveling in Portland, and they knew they knew that I had just been there. And there was a bakery bakery I liked that's still there called Ken's Artisan Bakery, and they were looking for it. And I was trying to describe it to them, and sure enough, led the way. And my stepmom Jane said that that was like their food GPS, and I was just thinking of starting a blog at that point, so the name stuck. Oh, it's perfect. I know it's. I it's almost. It should be. It really should be an app. Is there an app? Um, there, that goes there, with the there has been an app over the years. Not at the moment. Uh, so how do you? So yeah, the Vanner community is not really known for its food. Um, Portland's a little different. Um, so when you, how do you go into a city and figure out what and where to eat? Right. Well, I like to travel with my family as much as possible, which is a, a bit more challenging these days for everybody. But um, basically, a lot of it is based on past experiences and, and figuring out what to look for, what's local, what has a unique sense of place. And the goal is to be able to experience foods when I travel that I wouldn't be able to experience in LA, which is pretty hard to do considering 
the depth and breadth of food we have in OA, but uh, there's certainly, that's the goal. So where do you start? Does it start with where online, if you start online, or does it start the minute you get off the plane, or does it start the minute you, you get out of your hotel room and you just start walking? Where does it start and how does it begin? It varies because I used to have a lot more time to devote to re re advanced research before uh, my wife and I had two daughters, <laughs> but now it's normally a last minute blitz of looking through Instagram and, you know, websites and Yelp, you name it, just, and as many tools as possible. But what we find is just being open to different experiences, which is a big component of history is delicious is to be an open to new experiences. So if we go to a restaurant that we like, once we hit the destination, we'll ask where else we should go. And basically constantly asking where should we go once we have a good experience and people are always pretty open to talking about where, what they like. And then, you know, if we post on Instagram, people will message us or chime in <laughs> about where else we should be going. So, so social fun. media. Yeah. So social media between your community and then also Stacy, which um, I think people who are watching me not know um, your wife, Stacy's son um, is in charge of Dine LA. And, um, right. those of you, yep. and for those of you who don't know, um, Josh and Stacy are very big in our LA food community. Um, they're in the LA food. They're definitely an LA food cup. Um, food power couple. <laughs> um, so we really love having you both. How do you guys, um, do you guys talk about food at home all day, every day? <laughs> Constantly. I mean, we're always trying to figure out where we can get to. I mean, logistically, it's a bit more challenging with two little girls, but we're always, thankfully, uh, our parents are nearby and we're able to, uh, they're able to watch after the girls and we'll go out on different date nights and it always revolves around food and get as far as we can, as fast as we can. <laughs> so how many restaurants do you think you went to in a year, 365 days, before COVID and before the girls? So your girls are how old? One and four. One and four. And so pre-COVID, pre-girls, how many restaurants do you guys go to in a year? Well, I certainly uh, go to a lot more than my wife. I mean, we have a lot of shared experiences, which is great. But now that the girls are in preschool, I'm able to get out during the day and go on missions as needed and just as I want throughout the city. And I was in Claremont yesterday, try, try to get it as get in as many stops as I can too when I'm out, really make it count. So per, per, per year, I would say hundreds of different restaurants. I was about ready to give you some sympathy and, and tell people how sad it is that you're, you aren't going to as many restaurants, but that doesn't seem yeah. to be the case. Well, it's so different, but uh, certainly different types of restaurants and a lot of them would be, you know, more casual these days, or we were doing a lot of takeout, of course, during the pandemic, just mm -hmm. to try to support restaurants. And, but now, you know, now that, patio dining is open and even indoor dining we're both vaccinated so is there anywhere what are some of your favorite restaurants in la to take the girls to <laughs> well it's interesting to think about what their favorite restaurants would be and then i think tonight's choice for them was between in and out and shake shack <laughs> which, i couldn't yeah. agree more oh. <laughs> tough choice but uh you know the, the ones that we go to pretty often let me think about it real quick well we live in eagle rock and we'll just like, grab some bagels from doll's bagels go have saturday morning brunch with the family or yeah. a lot of places in the san gabriel valley there's one called saigon flavor i don't know if you've been there or not i haven't been there i think I it, there, there's some loose connection to to um golden deli i think it's one of the family members split off it's basically an identical menu but oh i haven't i have to go i know we're kind of a faux filet family so we end up going oh, there a lot yeah we tried, a, we tried a new place called Golden Delight. Oh, yeah, Golden we've been, Delight. We've been, Golden Delight. 
And we got cut off though, because it's like we got there seven oh seven, and they serve only a Chinese menu, and so no pho, oh, no Vietnamese food. It's really interesting. So yeah, so we haven't really had it. So, um, and I know that near you, there's so many good places in Highland Park and Echo Park, um, in Eagle Rock right now. Um, I'm very partial to the Harache's place. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, I really love. Um. Have you taken the girls to a Michelin star restaurant or would you? We did go to uh, Montage one time when uh, Imogen, our oldest daughter, was younger down in Laguna and ate at studio. And that went about as well as you thought it would. I mean, basically, at some point, she doesn't want to be in her seat anymore. And that's what our youngest daughter is going through now. So it was a uh, quick getaway back out of the restaurant but uh, we've we've attempted it a couple times because we're pretty determined but they don't always cooperate and just have to go with what they want basically we'll cut them off short if we have to Aww. <laughs> um do you have to convince them to go to restaurants with you the daughter your daughters well our older daughter i mean we could put in front of a uh, ipad at this point but our our youngest daughter is immune to that. So, <laughs> so she'll start running around. It's it's uh, my wife's father's birthday. And he's having a Chinese banquet, like Cantonese style banquet on Friday. And they're kind of come. So we'll see how that goes. Ah, uh, the iPad, the magical, magical iPad. Hey, I want to um, talk about your writing a little bit because this is something I've always wanted to know about you. What kind of food writer do you consider yourself so you're not a critic are you a reporter or you like what like i'm always trying to figure out i mean it's a weird question but how do you identify with your like your writing what what it is definitely not a critic and definitely not incognito i know a lot of the true critics of which there are very few these days you know would never actually bring a camera to a meal i do that to document my experiences. So that would be one giveaway. Even in this era where everybody's taking photos on their iPhones, it's still pretty conspicuous to bring a camera. And uh, I like meeting people and asking questions too. So that's another reason I can never be a critic. I, I like to learn about different people and their stories. And uh, that's more exciting to me than just silently sitting, judging food and describing the scene. Although I, I, I do describe the food and, and, and set the scene for readers, but more like a uh, to celebrate what's really great about the restaurant community. Yeah, there's definitely not enough of you. I <laughs> <laughs> um, do you come in with, I mean, you go to so many different places. Um, do you have reference points of what you think the restaurant should or shouldn't be before you go in? Not always, no. I mean, there's certainly types of cuisines I'm much more familiar with. So that's where I'll really ask a lot of questions and, and kind of lean on the people in the restaurant to learn more about it, especially if I'm enjoying it. I mean, there's times where I'm not, I don't have the energy to probe as much as I could just because either I'm not in, in particularly inspired and I don't see a, uh, a way a, a way to tell that story that would be compelling for people mm -hmm. or uh, but yes I mean there are certain food writers who focus on particular cuisines and really hit that hard again and again and again and have all the contacts for that one or genre of food but uh, I'm more interested in exploring as much of the world as possible. I'm very curious and mm -hmm. getting to learn more about different cuisines, even if it might not be as in depth as some people explore those cuisines. And well, I think I want to connect back to the book a little bit. So there's this, this book, um, <laughs> Delicious History, which I, again, really, really love. Did you have to go out and ask a lot of questions or consult a lot of people for this book? Uh, I did not. So I think uh, part of the reason that I chose the different cuisines that I did is that there was some familiarity with them. Just either I've traveled to these countries or had uh, extensive experience locally with these 
cuisines in most cases. There were a few that uh, not so much like um, Egypt or Turkey, for example, which I really enjoy, but just don't know quite as much about that uh, decided to feature because they're so important just in terms of their culinary history. Wanted to be able to tell those stories in the first round of stories for History is Delicious. Um, yeah, if we were to do another book, it would be great to include kind of culinary ambassadors from each cuisine to be able to you know, get a bit more nuance. I, I feel like did as, as well as I could, certainly in this case. And I think people will really enjoy what they learn. Yeah. And for readers who um, haven't seen the book yet, it's a book that has different cuisines, which I really want to talk about that word in a second. Um, different cuisines and like like some of the items that are like popular or known in that cuisine. And it goes more in depth than I thought it would. I was really, oh. I was really impressed with what you chose to cover um, in each of the cuisines. Not that, you know, I'm Thank just you. speaking to Vietnamese when I'm like, it's really cool the way you describe it and the way I just, you know, it made me love Vietnamese food, you know, just like, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Yeah. So, so I really enjoyed that. I, um, I want to talk about the word cuisine in a second because most of the, Cuisine is cuisines is defined by countries they come from. Is that how you, as a writer, define cuisine? Well, had to be, define it that way in a sense for this book. Even though what I tried to do with history is delicious is to show how much we have in common with different countries. So there is certainly a lot of overlap. The, the dividing lines are very blurred in many cases. Mm -hmm. So, but just to spotlight some of the differences, some of the dishes tell a lot of stories of particular dishes, and in many cases, not always, you could trace particular dishes to certain countries, and then geographically, as the way the way the world is currently constructed, which is not the way it always was constructed, those were the dividing lines. I know this is a this is a conversation I want to have with you later when we can go deeper, but I really was interested because I I've had, you know, I know that you have thoughts on diasporic um cuisines mm -hmm. and you know um I, I think it's just a really you know I was actually surprised that it was listed by country of origin. So I was like, huh. But <laughs> I really want to ask you, why did you not have anything for the United States or what is considered American food? Good right. Choice. <laughs> that was an idea that we kicked around a lot. Certainly when uh, Brooke and David Knight, who are the publishers with Honest History, they came to me with the idea for History is Delicious, and they had a very rough outline, and it could have gone in a lot of different directions at that point. And one thing that I definitely didn't want to do was to have a Eurocentric book, because I feel like that is overstating the importance of Europe's culinary influences, because they draw on so many other factors from around the world. And in many cases, they uh, basically forced those culinary influences into their societies through colon colonialization. So I didn't wanna give them too much credit. And I feel like even though this book is not for people just in the US, I feel like anybody who, uh, who speaks English because the book is only printed in English at this point, hopefully, that can change, but um, I feel like it was many readers would be in the United States and it's kind of like exposing to people different influences that aren't necessarily around them. So trying to expand their universe or concept for food. Yeah, I personally loved how thoughtful the book was and it was like these very, like, you know, I hope I'm not giving too much away, but like it's the- yeah, the indigenous cuisine part. I just, I just thought it was just so thoughtful, and some of the decisions that were, I know that there's stories behind them, and I'm sure you guys discussed. Uh, maybe you can tell us if you did. You discuss them at, at not, you know, at length. Um, these these decisions that were made, but I just thought it's really there's certain acts of activism and thoughtfulness that I really enjoyed on a different level as you know, as a chef and someone who really cares about these things, and I, you know. I, I, I was really impressed how thoughtful it was. And Thanks. so, but 
was were they long was everyone on the same page was it something that you had to fight for you know uh brooke was my main editor on this brooke knight one of the co-founders of honest history and they gave me a really free reign to construct the outline and to basically take the book in the directions that I saw fit, which was kind of remarkable. So for better or worse, this is the result, which I think is, you know, I'm proud of it. So hopefully people can get inspired by what they read. When did you, uh, when did you, when did the proposal come? When did the offer come? Did it, has it been years in the making? Um, how did it come about? How well, did you write the book? I don't know the the full backstory, but my involvement started really last November, so really not that long ago. That's when I think when we had that initial conversation, either last October, last November, and then by November, end of November, I was writing the book, and by the beginning of February, you know, had the book together. And um, <laughs> wow. It's, it's kind of like uh, my dad always says, just make the same decisions faster. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, I I just think, you know, for anyone who's ever tried to write a, a book, especially one that has recipes um, and one that's so in-depth, I that's very, very fast. Um, and well, I'm very fortunate. I'm glad you mentioned the recipes. So I've got four great recipes for some local chefs. You probably know. So I love that part, too. I know. I hope I wasn't giving it away. It's like there's all these Easter egg. I What I love about the, of the book is there's all these tiny little Easter eggs that <laughs> you don't really think that's what the book is about. And then you kind of, you know, as you read it and you flip through it, and it's one of these books that you can read it chronologically all the way through, or you can use it as a reference book, or you can just turn to the section that you want to read. Or I even love the way you opened it with the place setting, no pun intended, the setting. Of the book. Um, <laughs> nice. I just thought that again was really thoughtful. Um, and it just, it set up the book so well and like, okay, this is someone who is really going to be open-minded and wants you to be open-minded, um, when looking at this book, it was really thoughtful of many different cultures. Um, I thought it was like a, I, that's why I wanted to ask you what you thought of the word cuisine, because I thought that it would have been a constraint for you to put, you know, to have to put everything under a country, knowing, knowing how much you know about different cultures and, you know diasporic cooking um for example there's like i'm surprised like you know like i really was going to ask you like in the future if you were to do a book again where would you put um you know jewish deli food right yeah i mean there's a lot of ashkenazi traditions there for eastern european uh, jewish food i mean yeah it'd be interesting if we were to expand it out to the u.s what that would look like. I mean, all these are basically social constructs. So it's basically how do people divide up the world or see the world. Yeah. And what I was trying to do is really not only talk about the history of particular dishes, which is interesting in many cases. And in many cases, I didn't know the origins until researching the book, which was great. So there's so much more to learn. But I also wanted to talk about how people eat around the world, where you talk about things like the table settings around the world. And then there's spices and condiments of the world. So just people eat differently all over the world, but there are a lot of commonalities, especially what, today. <laughs> what are some of those commonalities that you discovered um, when researching? Well, I mean, you talked about the indigenous ingredients of the Americas, so that's really you know, the uh, epicenter for a lot of the different ingredients that people associate with you know, their cuisines, which, you know, things like chilies or tomatoes or avocados that are synonymous mm -hmm. with certain cuisines. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are from the Americas originally, and people find very different uses as these ingredients expand around the world, which is one of the great things. I mean, food is constantly evolving, as you know. And yeah. so a lot of the dishes that I feature in the book were unimaginable even 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, because I think, so do you think this book is written um, from the perspective of these different countries by an American? Because, you know, we think, or do you think it's more from the perspective like you know is there a perspective 
besides yours? I mean, did you did you put on a lens or a filter? Right. That's where I feel like the culinary ambassadors would come in handy if we have the opportunity to include those voices from different cultures around the world in the next edition. I feel like because it's a kind of surface in a way, only able to feature a few dishes per country and then talk about things like dumplings of the world or noodles of the world that are found across the globe, um, had to make some choices. So would somebody who's, for, I mean, would you have chosen the same dishes for Vietnam, for instance? Right, yeah, exactly. But I, but, I, <laughs> but, I, but I totally got it. I love all those dishes, but then which ones, you know, like how did you choose which dishes to cover? Well, can we, let's go back out. How did you choose which cuisines to cover? And then how did you choose which dishes was within those cuisines to cover? It was a challenge because basically there's only 80 pages to work with and thinking about, you know, historically there's value everywhere. So I, the way I see it, there's value in every type of food around the world and because people have so, put so much tradition and culture, it's instilled with so much more than what's on the plate. So it's very tough to exclude. I tried to be as inclusive as possible with the choices and uh, hopefully did a, a good job to start. But yes, there's always way to be, ways to be more inclusive and would certainly touch on different parts of the world, would certainly love to include more of more of Africa in the second edition. Mm -hmm. uh, there's several countries there. We didn't even talk about Australia at all or the United States at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's yeah. like I mean, yeah, the United States would need more than 80 pages alone. I think California itself would need more than 80 pages alone, could. right? <laughs> yeah. um, were you thinking about um did you think of an audience who you would write this for? Were you thinking about your girls one and four? <laughs> In the future, I, I'm looking forward. I've read some chapters with my oldest daughter, and uh, she showed some interest. <laughs> I think she's interested that her father wrote a book, but the Aww. idea of me, <laughs> which is nice. I mean, yes, it's uh, very suitable for children. There have been some people who said it's uh, beyond. Uh, childhood reading levels in some cases. And uh, the way I see it is anybody who's eight and above like, loosely would benefit from it. I feel like even other professional food writers are bound to learn something and other chefs, you know, chefs would be are bound to learn at least one thing reading the book. I mean, because, you know, I, people... yeah. it's a good reference book. It's a really Thanks. great reference book. I mean, it's like, yeah, I'm you're, I'm totally going to insult you, but I'm like, it's like the cliff, like it's like the best set of cliff notes you'll <laughs> ever get, you know? You know, it's like, I'm not saying it's like going to take in everyone's perspective, but it gives you like, okay, quick. Oh, yeah. Okay. Got it. You know? And it tells a lot about the culture, not just the food itself, but a little bit why this food is important to this culture. I really like that part a lot, too. Um, and how it's eaten and where it's eaten a little bit. So I think that's real. It, it, yeah, it's a good reference book to have. And it's one that in this COVID day and age when everyone has horrible ADHD, um, it's very digestible. Um, you know, good work. Yeah, digest. But it's it's really just a lovely, lo you know, it's, I think it's a great coffee table book. It's a great conversation book. Um, I think everyone should have one. You know, I think, yeah, I I can't talk about it, you know, how great it's going to be this this holiday for everyone to have a copy um, floating nice. around, you know, the holiday dinner table. Um, but yeah, the goal is definitely to uh, introduce, you know, a brief overview, provide some context about different cultures and how the cuisines ended to be, be where they are at this stage. And then just to give people some tips, like if they're going to eat dim sum or Korean barbecue, what might the table setting look like and that sort of thing. And how do you approach these experiences? And so it's kind of some tools for if you want to go find this in nearby, near where you live, then 
here are a few dishes that, that would be a good place to start and you'll know about those dishes. And then there's certainly deeper exploration to be had. What um, was, is, was there a country that you found most challenging and that you didn't know anything about before the book? I uh, didn't know nothing. I mean, I wouldn't say there's a country I knew nothing about, but even though like I thought Vietnam, for instance, was very interesting and that I've traveled there and eat constantly in little Saigon and, you know, to, I didn't actually know the stories of many of these dishes other than uh, I don't think I made it into the book, but like the one dish that I know for sure is Chaco La Vong because I've been to the restaurant in Hanoi, but mm -hmm. Even fun me, which I have all the time. I didn't know the true origin of that. And hopefully this is a close enough version. There's so many different stories. I mean, there's yeah. so many different origins. And I think it's so just like a lot of cuisines, you know, ethnic cuisines, there's so many different origins. And there's so many different regions that make maybe the same dish differently. And a lot of these dishes are best. A lot of like pho is something, you know, like each family makes it different. Um, each region makes it different. Um, even, you know, jazza, which is, you know, called egg rolls or spring rolls or imperial rolls are very different um, in each family and each, you know, each part of the country um, regionally. So sure. it's, it's a, you, yeah, it's a very hard job. I, you know, it's, I don't know how you decided and how, okay, well, let me ask, which part was your, what part was your favorite? Which country was your favorite to write about? My favorite. I wish you had like 80 more pages just devoted to that country. Well, I mean, there's there's certain cuisines that uh, require four pages in a sense because they're so daunting and so regional, like China or Mexico or Japan. In Japan, we've been able to go to a couple times in the past few years and not it have not even scratched the surface after several weeks there it's like and so so hyper focused and hyper seasonal and mm -hmm. regional for example and I, I, the, I, I think those are the ones that i enjoy most because it is the biggest challenge and those are the ways to learn and you know, yeah how did you you know like japan's a good a good one how did you narrow it narrow it down like you know like well, in that case, it wasn't specific dishes. It was more uh, styles of eating. So yeah. like yakitori or sushi right. just, uh, in terms of how people eat versus, you know, a specific skewer or a specific piece of uh, nigiri. Yeah. Um, if, if and when we ever end this pandemic, um, do you have a dream place you want to go to in the world? A dream uh, <laughs> we talk about that a lot because a lot of it is just dreaming at this point. <laughs> <But> <laughs> definitely uh, looking forward to getting back to Japan, for instance, or definitely inspired to go to South America now, just since, can, since so many ingredients can be traced back to the Andes, for, for instance, or the Amazon basin. And that would be interesting. And I love the Middle Eastern food. So to be able to explore that region in person would be incredible. Now, if you had to choose just one, would you choose to eat at a Michelin star restaurant? Like something that, you know, recommended by the Michelin guide? Or would you rather just get off, get out of your hotel room or wherever you're staying and, and just walk by foot and go to the first place that catches your eye? It would you just... <laughs> yes, I mean, no, no offense, because I know you just earned your first Michelin star. Congratulations. <laughs> but um, I would probably just go to uh, something more basic, especially now that we have the girls. It's a uh, it's a challenge. No offense taken. I haven't even <laughs> acknowledged the Michelin star yet. So well, I will for you then. It's amazing. <laughs> it's quite Thank an accomplishment. You. 
Thank you. Um, but yeah, I do the same. I We have accidentally ran into Michelin star restaurants just by going to a place that we love and just, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm much more of like, just, just get out there and just try something, you know, that no one, you know, hope, you know, hoping you discover something that you love. So it, yeah. I know you're of the same spirit, so I had to, add it, had to ask. <laughs> um, the, Tough question. Um, I know, I know. Um, I think there's a there's some questions being asked. Um, I'm gonna jump into that, and if because I have a thousand more questions for, for you, but I think it would be really nice to hear what others are asking. Ooh, Grace. this is a really good one. Um, what is your least favorite food? Oh, <laughs> it's hard not to find. Well, okay, but now that you say it, it's easy. Anything with truffle oil, I find pretty repulsive. Right? Can we talk about that for half of us? Like, I love truffles. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't get truffle oil. It's like, in, it's normally like synthetic, and it just I, yeah, it makes me queasy. <laughs> it surprises everyone that I feel the same way. I'm like, it's just not quite right. It's just it it just smells synthetic. It feels very lab driven. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll try anything. I mean, when we were in. Um, Mexico City a couple years ago, we eat my gay worms, we eat, you know, you name it, ant eggs on that same trip, so Eskimos. So I'm I'm up for whatever. Um, what? Um, going back a little bit about, do you? Okay, let's talk about food media for a little bit because I know that you're a part of food media, and it's always a fun question to ask. Okay. Um, do you think? Where do you think the future of food media is going and how do you find yourself in it or is that a loaded question you just answer it the way you want to well i plan to keep i feel like i found a a good niche within the food writing world just focusing on places that are generally more out of the way just uh, more independent family run often or and uh places that wouldn't you wouldn't find celebrities <laughs> So that those are the types of stories I want to tell, and thankfully there still seem to be some editors who are open to that. Um, there's a question that says, "Where would you recommend someone to go eat who's visiting or new to LA? Where should they start?" I know they can go to your blog, but like if they didn't have time and they only had like you know they just got off the plane, where should they go? Okay, yeah, I mean there's certainly some favorites. I mean of your restaurants, of course. They're there, Phenakite and Porridge and Puffs for when it resurfaces. They're so nice. And then um, certainly favorites. Let's let's scan the city mentally. So Casilla in Santa Monica, I enjoy mm -hmm. for kind of modern Southeast Asian food. There's um, we just had a uh, celebratory meal. Speaking of, this was a very rare occasion of uh, fine dining. My wife and I celebrated basically three uh, occasions in one at Hayato, which we thought was very special. That's a good one. <laughs> so that's like uh, kaiseki, so uh, pretty traditional Japanese seasonal cuisine in downtown. Mm. What are some other ones that uh, keep going back to? What about, yeah, what about places that are really, you know, you don't have to book anything. You just right. got up, you know, where, where should you stay if you are not from LA and you don't, you haven't been to the city? Cause you don't, cause I don't think people should stay in Santa Monica where they usually stay. Um, where should people I, stay? I think downtown is a good jumping off point because that way you could get to the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, you could get to South LA. We live in Eagle Rock. So I should mention actually the foods that we eat all the time, not just the special occasion places. So we love, kebabs, there's amazing charcoal grilled kebabs at places like Hamlet's Kitchen. There's a new one that I really enjoy called Verna Tune that has some Armenian dishes that you can't find many places. That's probably one I'll end up writing about. And even Arts Bakery, which is basically mm -hmm. a longstanding bakery. They installed this amazing charcoal grill, the whole room as big as some restaurants just to grill kebabs. So those are three places that we go to pretty often. And then the San Gabriel Valley, because my uh, my wife grew up there and her parents still live there. 
So we just enjoyed um, Tam's Noodle House. Have you been there over? No, I haven't. I might yeah. go tonight. It's in San Gabriel. So they do um, chicken wings with salted duck egg batter. Ooh. And they do um, typhoon shelter noodles. So it's like a vermicelli with rice, you know, rice, rice noodles with shrimp and squid and fish and then crispy fried garlic on top. That was, that was really good too. And then mm. I mentioned Saigon flavor go there pretty often. And we've been, uh, the one you mentioned, Golden Delight, we've gone to a couple times too. That's I love San Gabriel Valley. I think it's it's a it's a challenging one because I've recommended to people from out of town and they're like, how do you get there a mass transit? And then I I just then I'm like, oh shit. You, you can't you can't, can you? Well, uh, certainly uh it depends what part because the gold line passes through Arcadia and through all the way past there. So the, it's possible. See, be... I'm glad I asked you because I didn't even know that that the gold line passed through it. Yeah, so what, um, I don't even so... know if they call it the gold line anymore. I feel like they rebranded it. <laughs> so you can get to places in the SGV. So SGV is something we talk about a lot. Um, mm -hmm. That I think for me, SGV and K-Town are my favorite. I'm oh, glad you mentioned K-Town. Yeah, I'm interested to hear your favorites, but Soban, for instance, yeah, Korea. yeah. So I the raw, raw marinated crab and the crab. spicy calbee gin. I love I love I love them all. I mean, yeah. our go to is probably Western Doma Noodle House. Um, Western Doma oh, Noodles. Nice. Like nice. it's just comforting, and it's. I think I tend to choose spots where it's not crowded, where I can go mm -hmm. into my. I you know I think I like to I like to eat alone a lot. Mm -hmm. So I like places where I, I'm sure in the past, you know, when you just food GPS before you met Stacy, you know, but I just love eating alone. Um, you know, I have a partner and kid and I love them both, but there's times when I'm like, I just like places where I can eat alone. And, sure. and I so, I tend to like, yeah, yeah, so I tend to like pick places um, because I talk about food all day. Right. So there's times nice. when I just want to eat and enjoy. And because if I eat with anyone else, it's always like, what do you think? It's the dissection. And I'm like, sometimes I'm like, I just want to enjoy this. Can we not talk about? I don't know if that happens to you. Can you just have a well, you have girls, so it's about them. But can right. you just can you just have a meal and enjoy it without dissecting it? I think my my very good friend Robert Kratz is here. And he he know like there's no meal that we've ever had together where I don't dissect it somehow. Yeah, I know you could I'm sure you could get more granular on the food because you're creating so often. That's gotta be impossible to avoid <laughs> it is and it's just like and some people think it's criticism I'm like no i just like you know i'm this is not a criticism i'm just saying that you know it's not my palate it's just different and people think it's like oh, you know you don't like it. it's not good i'm like no it's great it's just that you know i like things a little bit more acidic or well it's just personal preference um sure. but everyone wants to know like you know i'm eating i'm like well what do you think i'm like well, here's what i think i love it <laughs> I think that's my go-to answer. Ninety-nine percent of things, it's like, who cares what I think? I love it. Let's keep eating and talk yeah. about something else. There's something to be said for going back to the same places. Although I'm always tempted to try new places, but if you go to a place where you know it's, they're just going to nail it, then you don't have to think about it, and you're not going to get those questions. No, and it's like so, and it's so comforting, you know. And that's what comfort is, right? I think like there's you eat for different reasons. I don't know if you're the same way, but. I, well, you know, I think about it a lot with the Fenakite menu because I always think about um, a lot of multi-course meals um, are so much about showing off and being impressive and having this great presentation, which, you know, we do all of that. But I also feel like there's been fine dining restaurants and multi-course meals where I've eaten 20 courses and I go home and I'm still hungry. Like my mind is like, I'm so inspired and so excited that I'm like, did I really eat or did I just go to class? <laughs> and um, and so I think like with our, with Fenakite, I'm really conscious of that where I'm like, you'll have a little bit of class and like, you know, the first few courses we'll talk about and we'll have stories. And then I'm like, in the last few courses, I'm like, just eat, just like be loved. I'm cooking for you because I love you and I care about you and I want you to be satiated and I don't want you to have to, have to go to McDonald's or to have a bowl of rice when you go, you know, on your way home. Because I've like, that's happened to me. I don't know if, if it's happened to you where I go home and I'm like, God, I really need a bowl of rice right now. <laughs> that's the classic complaint about fine dining tweezer food <laughs> is that uh, 
people are still hungry afterwards. But yeah, I mean, occasionally. Yeah, but I but I think it's not because there wasn't enough food. It's all the emotional, um, you know, you have to be emotionally sated. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's something that we think about a lot. And and I think I tend to eat at places when I'm off the clock, when I'm not traveling or doing research. I tend to eat at places where it emotionally sate, you know, where I'm emotionally satiated uh, more than um, than having to study it or to think about what's going on. Like it's just solid, good food, which is what we should all be eating nine ninety nine. 9.9% .9 of the time. And then when there's special occasions and you're like, yeah, you know what, I'll go in, you know, right now and, and dissect this and have going a little experience. Um, but it's interesting how food, food can be an everyday, it can be a commodity. And then I'm trying to collapse the space between it being a commodity and art. Mm. And is that something as a writer, I'm just, now I'm just going off, off the script. But is that something you see happening as a writer and as an observer of food and culture? Do you see that space collapsing at all in the last few years or um, ever? Well, I feel like there's a place for all sorts of a range of experiences all the time, whether it's the, you know, a bowl of pho or a restaurant like yours. I mean, there's certainly a place for special occasion cuisine absolutely and in terms of i feel like fine, fine dining is more prevalent even these days which um are you finding that to be the case i th i think there's gonna be a really distinct bifurcation um something i think about a lot because i think the way i don't know i'm i'm thinking about it a lot i'm like is the way of the which will be heartbreaking because LA is made of these amazing artisanal restaurants that's right in the middle. Like, you know, it's does all the art, it's all the art, all the great food, all the great ingredients, but it's food you can eat every day. Mm -hmm. But it's the labor and the ingredients are so high that at some point they and we and me we're gonna have to raise prices and does that put us into another category does that put into a category where, where you can't eat it every day and is that okay and i'm you know as a consumer and as you know a chef i think about that is that okay and i am inching more and more towards like you know what there maybe we shouldn't eat out so much maybe you know what these people's labor should be really respected um and we should really pay them what they deserve and you know what, let's find out how hard it is to cook at home and for ourselves. And it shouldn't be, you know, restaurants shouldn't be there for convenience. It should be there to celebrate and to cook. Yeah, I don't know. So, but then I go back and forth. But then I'm like, well, is that going to take away places that rely on, you know, I, so, I don't know. That's a good question for you because I think about it a lot. I, I, personally, I think there's going to be a bifurcation. Like, there's going to be, like, things that are a little bit, like I'm simplifying porridge and puffs. Porridge and puffs has always been in that middle space where it wants to do everything. It wants to have all the fine dining touches. It wants to have all the great ingredients, but it wants the price point of an everyday. I don't think that model works anymore. And I've been mm. thinking about it for porridge and puffs a lot, mm. but I think there's a place for porridge and puffs. And, but it is going to be a little bit simpler. Um, I'm okay with it personally, but it's also because I have phenakite. I don't know if I would be okay with it if I didn't have phenakite, where I can, you know, do all the floras and faunas and all those, you know, wonderful things, you know, all the creative strokes. And, you know, I can, you know, tease out ideas and, you know, really play with ingredients, you know, and spend ad nauseum and have a labor force that, you know, can work this way. Um, and still, we're losing money all the time, you know, yeah. phenakite. And so we're really, I'm really figuring out where, what's the role of a restaurant? And I think that's going to be all of us, you know, all of us figuring it out in different ways. What's the role of the restaurant for the next five years, 10 years, you know, after post pandemic? Yeah. If yeah. you have the answer, let me know. Cause I don't know. Well, I feel like the different restaurants have different roles in a way. I mean, there's porridge and puffs, which could be in every week or every other day day for restaurant for a lot of people. And then, uh, Fennekite, would be less frequent but still special so. that would be the goal i know and how do like you know how do i you know maintain the reasonable prices we have but still have amazing ingredients and still put the love and care in it because love and care really means human touch and human touch 
I can't be everywhere all the time. And how do you transfer that love and care to your team? And then how do you care for them? I think we always ask so much of our farmers and growers and cooks, but we rarely ask what we can do for them. And I think that's something that um, if you can get the word out, Josh, as a writer, um, you know, what have you done for your cook lately, <laughs> your restaurant cook lately? Right. Yeah. I mean, hopefully people see value. I'm sure people are clearly seeing value in what you're doing. So hopefully they'll see even more value and to the point where you can feel comfortable raising prices. And so you can have it, you can have it all. Thanks, Josh. I should I should go back to questions. I'm sorry, we totally uh, digressed. <laughs> I think we got um, a few minutes to do it. Yeah, we have a few more minutes. Tell me if you're, yeah, tell me if you're like, you know, sick of us yet, because which cuisine is your go-to comfort food? Well, part of it is a product of where I am in Eagle Rock. So I'm right next to Glendale. So it's a kebab heavy cuisine. So we're kind of sandwiched between Glendale and the San Gabriel Valley. And so we do a lot of Asian cuisine out in the San Gabriel Valley as well. Typically um, Chinese food, but sometimes Vietnamese food because my wife's family is Cantonese. So we'll do a lot of that. And yeah, those are the go-tos. Um, do you have like, do you have a heritage food? Well, I mean, I guess it would be Jewish deli food just in terms of both my parents being Jewish. And so I grew up going to delis in New York City. Specifically, the, the original Second Avenue deli was our deli of choice. Uh, <laughs> okay, can we talk about delis in LA? What's going sure. on with delis in LA? Where do we go? Because I, it's a constant question in our household. And we're like, do we go to Cantor's anymore? We can't, you know, it's like, we're like, eh. We go to Friedman's, but it's no longer Friedman's. Like, where do we go? Right. I just wrote a big story about the state of Jewish delis for Ventura Boulevard magazine, exploring, you know, are delis still relevant in today's food culture? And it's complicated because, like you said, Friedman's currently on hiatus. Many San, San Fernando Valley delis have closed. Langer's obviously still going strong. They do a good job. Um, Norm Langer's daughter now has a place on the Sunset Strip. I haven't been lately, but I did when they opened. That was solid for sure. Uh, Langer's, of course. Yeah. Brent, Brent's has some good stuff in Northridge. Um, mm -hmm. It's a challenge. I mean, there's a few that I think are do a good job, and then others that are more neighborhood places. Yeah. Like, we don't have like the prime meats and like the places like they do. Like, you know, in New York, you know, we don't, we obviously don't have Katz's, we don't have second, you know, second street, we don't have any, you know, we don't really have, and I wonder, I've always wondered why, because we have, you know, probably this, not, probably not in concentration, but in numbers, we have, you know, plen plenty of, you know. Well, Langer's, I put up with any deli, really. I mean, the de New York deli scene, I feel like is a little overhyped. <laughs> I mean, growing up on it, I can't say that there's a, uh, an incredible, Jewish deli, even in New York at this point, they're hard to find. Okay, what about Russ and Daughters? No? Oh, yeah, for that sort of thing, like the, the fish, the, yeah, the appet fish. appetizers, they call it. Yes, those, yeah, are, yeah. those are great. I wish we had that here. I do too. <laughs> I know. I really, yeah. I know. I've, my dream has always been an Asian Jewish deli. Um, <laughs> I asked, you know, Aaron and I, if Aaron and I were ever to open, you know, our dream restaurant together, we would oh. have a what would that be? That would be exciting. Right. Well, we talk about it all the time, right? Because like we have, you know, I have, por I have the poultry and mushroom porridge at Porridge mm -hmm. and Puffs. And he's like, it can just like be the matzo ball soup. You know, you can <laughs> just like, replace the rice with the matzo. You know, like it's just, and so we talk about how it's really, there's a lot of things that intersect. Like we have like the short rib and things, you know, and we can have the braised beef and the braised oxtails. It's just yeah. one step away. You know, you can have, like the braised oxtail, but instead of serving it with root vegetables, you can, you know, or I mean, you have to serve it with latkes, but you know, but what if you also served it with some noodles? I mean, that's. I, yeah, yeah, that sounds great to me. I mean. <laughs> the I, bastardization of both cultures, of all cultures. <laughs> I feel like Jewish delis are just so uh, heavy normally that it's hard to eat that often. 
I feel like a lot of people in LA feel that way, but certainly the, some restaurants like Langer's and Brent still have their customer bases for sure. Yeah. What a really fun conversation. Um, I should probably check questions again before I keep veering off. Um, <laughs> what is your guilty pleasure food or dish? Well, I don't feel much guilt around food. <laughs> that, that's for sure. Best answer. Um, let me, I'm still reading. Let me let me scroll through and before I get selfishly ask you more questions. Um, let me scroll through and see if there's some some other questions. Uh, I think I'm last call on asking Joshua Lurie a question, my friends. Join once. Join twice. Anything else you want to share with us? <laughs> well, uh, just want to thank uh, Romans and and you for participating in this talk. I I didn't know what to expect and to the types of questions you plan to ask, but they've been great. Oh, it's such an honor. I love love talking to you, and it's um. I hope I did you justice by being on the other side because it's usually you asking me the questions. Um, Thank you so much. And, you know, lots of love to Stacy and Imogen. What's the what's your one year old's name? I don't even think I know her name. Finley. Yeah, like, oh, such a yeah. great name. Um, I hope we cross paths soon. Um yes. post pandemic. Let's make sure of it. <laughs> yeah, and I can't wait to see. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Romans. Oh, there's Corey. Hi, Corey. Hi. Hi. Hey. That was wonderful, guys. Thank you so much. I I learned a lot, actually, and I can't wait to get out there. And I wrote down a whole list of all those restaurants that you guys were talking about. When I get back to L.A., I'm like, yes, we are going to all these places. Great. <laughs> I'm going to drag my partner around everywhere. He's been hiding out in Laurel Canyon for the last two years. So I'm going to get him out. But um, thank you. This was wonderful. And to our audience, if you would like to purchase the book, if you haven't done so, use that little green button down there at, at the bottom of your screen. You can do that right now. You can do it after the event is over. You can also go to romansbookstore.com and get your book. Um, and there is a replay. If you came late or if you want to share this with your friends and family, then, uh, yeah, you can go to the Crowdcast Live, Romans Live, and look for the replay in past events. And um, anything else before we wrap? That's all. Thank you. Okay. That's a wrap. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. And thank you, you for our audience. Okay. Bye. Bye.